Welcome. I'm not the person who normally does or should introduce a contemporary history speaker. And if several of you are getting terrible shocks of deja vu all over again, I can assure you, no, I haven't uh, come back from the CHI grave. Uh, but today, uh, the, the director of the CHI, uh, who is also my successor, uh, Professor Ingo Troschweitzer, has asked me to introduce today's guest. I'd like to thank Ingo for, for extending the invitation to her. I'd also like to thank Catherine, who I just saw. Oh, there you go. Uh, and, and who also helped bring her here. And of course, Connie Hunter, who made all the arrangements. Uh, it's, there's a reason why Professor Troschweitzer asked me to talk about today's guest. We have a special relationship, uh, kind of like, no, it's not like the British and the Americans. Um, but many years ago, feels like a thousand, but uh, I'm told that it was in the 1990s, um, this young woman came to my class who was studying journalism, was an HTC student in, at Ohio University, and I think took the class because it satisfied a requirement. She had some interest in Russia. She was going to study to be a journalist and wanted to know a little bit about Russia, and I think it was at the right time. And she took the class, and the subject of Russia fired her imagination. And so much so that she, I think, ended up taking every one class, every class that I offered, and one more, uh, an, a tutorial. And we hit it off, obviously. She loves Russia. Uh, a, a real interest in, and love of the place was sparked by the classes, but also by her subsequent study. She's gone on to great things. She, she did a master's and a PhD at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And from there went on and got a very coveted position in uh, City University of New York in Staten Island. As you know, it's hard to get these jobs and you have to be awfully good in order to do them. Uh, she, to get them, to land them. She has produced a book in, uh, last year, Imagining Russian Regions, which I just read. I had not been able to read it up until now, but I thought it would be fresh and, and, and be a, a good uh, former professor and mm -hmm. read the book. Well, it was a treat. It's, it's an excellent study. Too much of Russian history is written from the center, from Moscow and from St. Petersburg. That's where the records are. That's where a lot of the political action is. Her study is of a region of Russia, but it's not a sterile study of a region of Russia. An awful lot of local history is, is, is a real snooze fest where you study local history and you don't really want to draw any larger conclusions because it might be different in other places or whatever, and you're so timid that you really mm -hmm. don't do very much. In fact, she tackles one of the very big questions of Russian history in the 19th century, which is the desire of an awful lot of people out in the provinces to improve their lot to improve Russia, to harness the great power that was Russia, and yet being thwarted in this by a state that first encouraged them to do these things and then discouraged them from doing them. Uh, it wanted the power of industry, of modernization and of development, but it didn't want the side effects. Uh, this is a thing that you can see in other countries as we watch what's happening in Hong Kong today. Uh, this is not uncommon in other countries, but Russia was ahead of the curve in this as in so many other ways. Uh, I would like you to welcome a very special guest, Susan Smith-Peter, uh, who a, a, is not only a great s uh, success story in her own right, but is a great success story for Ohio University. I was able to uh, introduce her to my students today in a very class that she'd been in before mm -hmm. and say, you know, this is a success story. So congratulations and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miner. I know I should call him Steve, but it seems so strange <laughs> to, to, to call him uh, Steve. And, and now, you know, we're both full professors, which is like, wow, that's strange. Uh, so yeah, it has been really great to come back. I haven't been back to OU since the 90s, and it just feels wonderful to be back here. And really, I would not have written this book uh, without OU. I would not have written this book without Steve and what, without the experience that I had here. So it really has been great and I'm glad I can share my um, my findings with all of you. I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than I usually do. When I talk about my book, I usually talk about my book, just my book. But since this was part of the Contemporary History uh, Institute, I decided to do something a little bit different and really get into how my book uh, was shaped by the times in which I wrote it. And those times uh, spanned a considerable amount of time, partly because 
I was writing a, a variety of other works before I kind of capped it with the monograph. So that is what I will be talking about kind of in between the 19th century and post-Soviet Russia. So uh, Steve has very kindly shown you the book and you can see it here again, Imagining Russian Regions, Subnational Identity and Civil Society in 19th Century Russia. And I have really throughout the book intertwined these two topics of subnational identity and civil society and they are quite tight, tightly intertwined. So my own personal journey definitely began here at Ohio University. And I was an undergraduate in journalism, and I took Russian history courses with Dr. Minor. And these courses really did change my life, and I became interested in Russian history rather than in being a foreign correspondent. I had a prior interest in, in Russian, so I was already learning Russian, which is important because it's not something that you can pick up quickly. It, take some time to pick up. Uh, uh, but I decided, OK, I don't necessarily have to become a journalist. I can become a historian of journalism, among other things. So I do have this. I'm very drawn towards print and print journalism and to, towards uh, newspapers and towards the sort of social life of ideas. And that's something that I learned about really sort of experience as a journalist, too, because when you're writing, you're dealing with ideas. You're part of this larger community, and you're living you're kind of living the life of ideas in the world in a particular kind of way. And I suppose my writing is thinking about, well, how does that happen? You know, how do you take ideas and, and put them into practice? And so with these general ideas, as, as one does, when one enters graduate school, one does not exactly know what it's going to do. But I, with those general ideas, I entered the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the 1990s. And so there's going to be a lot about the 1990s in this talk. There's so many fascinating things that happened in the 1990s. So 1990s, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, so the best of times. Uh, for people who were maybe just born in the 90s, it's kind of hard to describe the difference. I mean, in the 90s, there was this real feeling that democracy was spreading through, throughout the world. There was a lot of hope for the future. I mean, there were even people saying that history would end, that we would all live in this kind of cornucopia slash utopia. Obviously, that didn't happen. But it was there was this sense of kind of wonderful things about to happen. Also allied with this was the opening up of archives. These archives, many of which in the provinces, KGB archives were open for a period of time, and so on and so forth, meant that there were these huge new fields that had not been studied by Western historians that were then open. Uh, and there was also a very strong belief at that time that Russia would soon become a democratic and, and prosperous country, and that this was a period of time, uh, you know, the troubles would, which would then end. It was also the worst of times in the sense that there was this huge disruption in Russia after the collapse of the USSR. In many ways, Russia of the 90s was almost like a failed state. I mean, it wasn't completely there, but there was a tremendous amount of disruption. Uh, a statistic that almost nobody knows, over the period 1991 to 2001, there were 2.5 to 3 million excess deaths in Russia from BMJ, all right, which is one of the top ranked journals in medicine, so about as uh, legitimate as you can get. So what are all these excess deaths? Uh, Deaths from cold, from not having penicillin, uh, starvation, just very basic, uh, avoidable kind of things. So we're talking about a lot of suffering, a lot of suffering during this period. Uh, the Russian state stopped funding many key cultural institutions and functions. And that's important because the Russian intelligentsia of this time and the intelligentsia of the intellectuals, which are almost like their own group. I mean, they are their own group. And they have a very strong group identity. And it tends to be, to a certain extent, hereditary, although open from, those who, from below, from those who want to join it. So what they did is through 
great personal uh, sacrifice, many of them kept their institutions going. So that would mean, for example, they might be working in a house museum where they wouldn't be paid for eight months at a time and would still keep on going to work for all this period of time, making sure that the institution did not collapse. And that's hard to even imagine. Of course, you have to grow your own food. That's the way you do it. You grow your own food. And, uh, but I think most people would not want to have to go through that level. Um, in the provinces, the 1990s were much worse than in Moscow and St. Petersburg. If one were in Moscow or St. Petersburg, one would not really come into contact with this this kind of uh, real, tangible feeling of uh, difficulty, um, almost collapse, that was out there. Okay. So, the 1990s, neoliberalism and civil society. So, neoliberalism, uh, for those who haven't come across it, is, is a very complicated thing. But part of the idea of neoliberalism is that the state should pare back, uh, that more state functions should be taken on by uh, non-state actors, uh, such as uh, civil society organizations. And uh, so the 1990s was a pretty neoliberal kind of moment. And things were happening in parallel, as it were. So, there was a lot of interest in civil society in Russia from the American government. And also a lot of interest in civil society in general. And so the idea is, as I said before, that you can start to divest a little bit of the welfare functions of the state and they'll be taken over sort of thousand points of light idea from those who um, remember that, this idea that you, know, you have all these, these other groups and they can take this on. Um, also, there's a widespread belief that civil society led to democracy, that it was always a positive. And within the larger context of this interest in civil society, a lot of Russian historians, and by that I mean American, British historians of Russia, as well as you know, historians within Russia as well, um, began to look at the history of voluntary associations. And that hadn't really been very much the center of attention because a lot of the story had been road to revolution, uh, economic questions, uh, intellectual questions of the sort of, well, where did the Bolsheviks come from? But then, of course, with the collapse, all of a sudden you have different questions that need to be answered. And I want to make clear here that I'm not saying that all historians who wrote about this in the 1990s were directly influenced by neoliberalism, not at all. I'm just saying that there was a larger context in which historians became interested in these topics, uh, and that larger context in many ways was this neoliberal moment. So, you know, it does not mean that there's kind of one to one uh, correlation here. So, there's all this discussion. Let's find out about the history of civil society in Russia. What I found, though, is it wasn't necessary to impose an idea of civil society on to Russia. Instead, Russia had a very long engagement with the context of civil society from within the Russian polity, from within the Russian intellectual sphere. Uh, and the first use was in 1703. And this drew upon Aristotle's idea of civil society as the opposite of uncivil or uncivilized society. And so this is squarely within the era of Peter the Great. So all sorts of Western ideas are being brought in, and this is but one of those many ideas. So then the next stage is in 1781, Adam Smith's idea of civil society as the highest of four stages of human life and history. It was translated into Russian by his student and the founder of Russian jurisprudence, Jesse Desnitsky. And by translated into Russian, it's this wonderful process by which Desnitsky had gone to the University of Glasgow. He had studied with Adam Smith. He was in the, in the uh, audience. He took notes, and then he went back to Russia and published them as his own work. So, but this is the 18th century. <laughs> So that's all good. This is a century of imitation, and imitation did not have a bad 
word, it, was, it wasn't bad. Because imitation only sounds bad from a romantic point of view. A romantic point of view is like, oh, you must be authentic, you must be original. But from an enlightenment point of view, there is a certain standard. And if you have to reach that standard through imitation, good for you. That's fine. So it's, it's not like I'm somehow unmasking this person. Many people were doing this all around, and it was not a bad thing. So the 1840s, we get a different moment of the introduction of civil society, and that's Hegel, of course, a German philosopher, Hegel. Um, and this is, we're getting closer to um, our own idea of civil society, which is a space between the family and the state. That space is usually taken up by voluntary associations or other groups and organizations. And um, Moscow University really was the place where this started to be spread. So what happened is many of the liberals of the time in Vladimir province, these are people who wanted to end serfdom, because serfdom was still going on. So uh, many Russians would actually own other Russians. Uh, the peasants, many of the peasants were serfs. The Hegelians who went back to their estates in the provinces were horrified by serfdom because of Hegel's idea of civil society, which was that there should be a group of property owners, and that group of property owners should be as universal as possible. Of course, you can't have a universal group of property owners if some of the people are actually property themselves. So. Hegel and his own ideas of civil society were very influential in uh, spreading uh, anti-serfdom ideas. And all these ideas are civil society. It's not that I'm in interpreting. No, they're using the concept of civil society. They're, they are using the Russian terms for civil society. They are uh, introducing uh, these concepts translated from uh, you know, all these different languages. So, the 1830s, the 1830s, what I call, I came up with the idea myself, the era of small reforms. And as I said before, I'm not imposing, I'm exploring. And Emperor Nicholas I, he was interested in spreading civil society. And that, again, is the Smithian idea of civil society, which Smithian said it was civil or commercial society. And civil or commercial society was his concept of roughly what we would call capitalism. Right? And this is the idea that you would have these people that would be able to, in a peaceful society, a non-militarized, non-militaristic society, that they would be able to work and spread their ideas, that um, men and women would both be uh, present in polished society. There's another term that was used a lot of the time, civil, polished, uh, the people who knew how to behave, civilized, uh, all of this we can see a larger kind of uh, concept that comes along just with the economics because you need to have property rights and contract law in order to have a really flourishing economy. So Nicholas was more interested in commercial society than in civil society, but he was aware that both of them were intertwined and that you just can't separate them out, that they are part of uh, the same package. And so he introduces this era of small reforms, is what I call it, and especially one part of it is the creation of this whole series of new institutions to study the province, each province uh, in European Russia, which is sort of in the center of Russia. It does not include Siberia. And these are also other economically oriented projects. Uh, these would be to encourage, um, to, you know, to encourage competition, for example, to allow people who are creating factories to learn what other factories there are, to spread new kinds of technologies, and to allow for the exchange of various kinds of ideas. And again, you can't easily separate out economic development from these other civil and civic uh, behaviors. And so Nicholas, he was quite a conservative, but he understood the need for economic development, and so he was willing to incorporate uh, these, these new ideas. So 
One of the things that struck me when I started digging into the history of, it's not yet the history of what I, what I would call full-blown civil society, but rather on almost like prehistory of what we would generally consider civil society, though, is it how many voluntary associations there were in the 1830s and 1850s. Uh, most of these voluntary associations have not been well studied at all. Uh, they're voluntary associations of noblemen who wanted to introduce new agricultural techniques. So all throughout the provinces, there were many of these voluntary associations, uh, these provincial nobles that would be working on new crop rotations, new mechanization, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, threshers and harvesters. And, of course, when you're trying to introduce advanced agriculture, it doesn't go very well with serfdom because that kind of thing, when you have advanced, when you have advanced equipment, illiterate serfs are probably not the best people to, to run that equipment. They, the two don't go very well together. Uh, and so these, these voluntary associations are spreading, and Nicholas is very interested in spreading them because of his economic ideas, uh, because of his belief that uh, he also believed that serfdom needed to end, but he thought it should end slowly, gradually, and in a kind of conservative manner. So he set out to create um, a new economic, not exactly a new economic system, but a newly vibrant economic sphere in the provinces. And what he ended up with is the rise of provincial identity. So in some ways, my book is a, is a tale of unintended consequences. You start out saying, oh yes, we want to have more economic development. You end up with something completely different from what you expected, uh, which is when people are studying their province and they're writing about their province and they're saying, I understand the province better, all of a sudden you start to get people to say, oh, I am from this province. Right? This province is part of me and I'm part of it. Whereas before they might have said, oh, well, I'm just from this particular town, right? Or their state identity, like a merchant or uh, a clergyman or, or something like that. So the idea of the Russian provinces, the idea of the Russian provinces, this is a, a big topic. I'm obviously not going to be able to get into great detail here. but. One of the aspects of this idea is in the 18th century, especially under uh, Catherine the Great, a new kind of way of looking at the provinces had been instituted. And that's this idea of the provinces as kind of blank space, space that could be inscribed in any way that the emperor or empress wanted. And here we have playing cards or kind of trading cards uh, for Samara uh, province. And I've also seen playing cards for various provinces from the 18th century. And it's the same kind of idea. Each card is equal. No card, well, in the playing cards, some have a somewhat higher rank. But in general, the idea is that these are interchangeable and they each have resources, they have ethnic groups, but in the end, they're not that different from each other. And in many ways, that's sort of what Steve is talking about with many uh, local histories up until pretty recently were written. It's sort of like, well, it's a case study. Uh, we can see, we can look at this province and that will tell us something about other provinces instead of saying this province is part of a particular group of provinces and they, they are similar and different from many other groups of provinces. So when you have this idea of a more kind of, uh, as it were, uh, blank sort of provincial slate, you do have a lack of feeling for belonging to that province. So instead, what comes about is something rather new, which is in the 1830s, a new provincial identity emerges. And it's influenced by Romanticism. Because of course, Romanticism is definitely interested in all the stuff that's going on in the provinces, because this is German Romanticism I'm talking about, but of course, it has many different branches in many different countries. Um, they're looking about, they're looking for authenticity. 
What is authentic? What is real? What is rooted? Who are the folk, right? Who are the people? What kind of folk costumes are there? What kind of folklore is there? What kind of dialects are there? And the local, in many ways, is the ground of romanticism because that's where you go to see these specific things. Statistics. Statistics is the other part of this. Now, statistics we think of as mainly numbers, but at this time it was more descriptive and in many ways it was more like an essayistic way of writing because you're taking, you're taking information, but you're presenting it in a particular way that anybody could read and it's not about uh, charts and tables. So what happens is when you combine the two of them, you have a way of describing the province which both claims to have scientific veracity and that also is claiming a kind of authenticity or soul. And the two of those together are actually pretty powerful. And the people that really get involved in this are these educated provincials. So priest sons, because the Russian Orthodox Church, priests can marry and therefore they have children. Those sons often join the bureaucracy and some of them become sons, of, I mean priests themselves. Old believer merchants, this is a kind of uh, religiously dissident merchant. Uh, the old believers uh, rejected church reforms that, that took place in the unfortunately timed year of 1666. Uh, and they, in many ways they've been compared to Calvinists, uh, townspeople, right? So all these people, these are people who live in towns who are not rich enough to be merchants. All these people are literate and they're able to both study the region and to make claims about it. To, to say, I know about this, I am part of this province. Now, these institutions that I talked about before in the, um, in the era of small reforms, these are the provincial statistical committees and the newspapers. And what these were, were institutions that were established in all of the uh, provinces of central Russia, and they were about discovering the province. So in the statistical committee, people would be stu studying the province, and then in the newspapers, they could publish the results of those studies. And so you start to have people who become experts on their town, sometimes even on their parish church. Uh, they have a public, people who are reading the newspapers. And so this creates this larger sense of provincial identity, not just municipal identity, but provincial identity. So now I'm going to turn to the 1990s as this moment of I am studying provincial identity in the 1990s, which was a particular time within the provinces as well. So the 1990s, uh, when I was doing a lot of my research uh, for this long series of projects that I've been writing about, this was a moment of rebirth, really, because the state had pretty much pulled out of providing subsidies, as I said before, so the, the state was no longer doing that. But what that meant is there was also an opportunity. Okay, there wasn't money, but there was a kind of freedom. People could start exploring with different ways of talking about their provinces, different ways of understanding where they were and what their, what their local meant to them. And there was a return to the 1920s. And the 1920s in Russia was really an amazing time. There was a lot going on in Russia that was very cutting edge. And one of those things was the study of the local. Uh, there's this very important public intellectual in Russia. I mean, he's you know since passed away, um, D.S. Dmitry Sergeyevich Likotrov, and he was sort of the bridge between the older way of studying the local and this new way, Karayvidnya, these local studies. And he was the one saying, let us bring back these amazing interdisciplinary approaches of the 1920s. These are bringing together history, art history, uh, the study of objects, the study of geography. And so we have a kind of totality. You're looking at the sum total of the culture in the provinces. And so there's this flood of publications from throughout Russia working on these topics. And Vladimir, and 
in American English it should be Vladimir, but that sounds weird to me, so I just call it Vladimir, so just understand that's what I mean when I say that. Um, so that's where I did my, my research then, and there was really a vibrant intellectual community. There are many people who are working on these topics. There were lots of conferences. There are lots of publications. And those 1920s, if some of what I was talking about sort of reminded you of the, 19, of the 1830s, that's because it was a culmination of that whole development. And the key thing here is that romantic idea of the totality, right? There's this idea that there is a kind of organic whole of provincial culture, and we can know it and put it together in all of its parts by looking through all these different disciplinary lenses. We can just achieve this sense of the sum totality of the of the province as a whole which is very much within a kind of romantic view of the world so also in the 1990s you do have this moment that is a, a time of humiliation for russia so this is a still from a video which often comes up when we're talking about this moment so Yeltsin had been drinking, of course, Yeltsin, you know, was in charge of Russia, and this is Bill Clinton, as we can see. Um, Yeltsin's pretty noticeably drunk in the video, and he's saying the media are the ones that have failed, not the talks I had with Clinton. And Clinton is laughing uncontrollably. Now, many Russians saw this as humiliating, because here is, you know, their president should be at a level of equity, and instead, uh, we have Clinton laughing uh, uncontrollably. Now, of course, Clinton could say, well, Yeltsin just told a funny joke, and he was kind of making fun of the media, and who wouldn't want to laugh at that? But when you look at the whole video, it, it, it does definitely have a sense of humiliation for it if one can put oneself in the uh, shoes of a, of a Russian uh, viewer. So 1990s in Russia, uh, you have these two things that are coming together, neoliberal reforms and corruption. So encouraged by the World Bank and the IMF, Russia in the 90s made a series of devastating cuts to social services, education, and culture. So I kind of mentioned this before when I was talking about the 90s. So this was, this was a very difficult time. Uh, and that was described to people at the time as the path to democracy. And parallel with this, there was a lot of corruption among Russia's elite. And so overall, given that people were being told, this is democracy, this is what democracy means, the experience of the average Russian was deeply negative in the 90s, deeply negative. Uh, and so when people say, well, you should work for democracy, the thought was, well, if that's what democracy is, forget it. That, that's, this is terrible. Um, and then this point, which I assume will lead to a bunch of questions, the US had money for a Marshall Plan for Russia, but the lessons of the Treaty of Versailles had been forgotten, right? So if you humiliate a country, bad things can happen. Bad things can definitely happen, uh, especially a country that, in this case, had defeated Hitler, had defeated Napoleon. I mean, the last person that was able to defeat the um, the Russians in a land invasion was Genghis Khan. That was a long time ago. So, um, so yes, yes, this, this is setting the stage for, for some very difficult things uh, that we are living through. So, now I'm going back to this other layer, the 1860s, the 1860s. So, in the 1830s, that's where I start my book, and the 1860s is, is where I end it. Now, Russian historians call the 1860s the era of great reforms. And that was a term that was used um, by liberal historians of the late 19th century. It was also a, an era of problematic reforms, as, as I argue. And one of the things that really struck me when I was doing this work is that times of reform can be as dangerous as times of conservatism. Because you can reform in a way that doesn't work. You can reform in a way that leads to even more problems. Um, so a lot of the work that had been done, especially in the 19th century, was very celebratory. 
something, because the liberal historians in Russia in the 19th century, they wanted to encourage the government to continue these reforms and to not stop the reforms. And yet these reforms also had seeds of, of revolution in them. Uh, one of the things I argue in the book is that Alexander II, who ended serfdom, uh, the way he ended serfdom, though, failed to really integrate the former uh, peasants, the former serfs who remained peasants. Instead of being given property rights as individuals, they were incorporated into collectives, uh, communes, and those communes still had a lot of control over their members. And so the thing that these Hegelians that I mentioned before, the, there were those people who had studied Hegel at uh, Moscow University, and they wanted to end serfdom. And what they really wanted was for the nobles and the former serfs to be part of a united group of property owners, and that the idea of property ownership would provide a common overarching civic identity. Uh, now, Hegel saw property as this ground of freedom, uh, basically the idea being that you would get money in the economy, and then if you had property rights, you could buy property, and then the state couldn't just come away and take everything that you had away from you. So that means that property is a guarantor of civil society because you can do things in between the family and the state and still have, as it were, ground to stand upon. Um, and yet, Hegel definitely prioritized unity over diversity. Uh, Hegel felt that uh, civil society was only a moment in which it was separated from the state, and it was a necessary moment, but that perhaps at some point in the future there would be a return to unity. Right? This, so there comes out of this engagement with Hegelianism a longing for unity, which in political practice is actually quite dangerous because it means that people who have different ideas often are seen as standing in the way of a unity that could happen if only they could see the, the light. So in the 2000s, in the 2000s, uh, as a as I was coming to the end of that discussion of, of uh, civil society from the Hegelian frame, the 2000s were similarly a moment where one can see and practice the limits of civil society. So in the 90s, the US government had done a lot to encourage the growth of civil society in Russia. Um, and that would be through you know, encouraging the development of NGOs, other voluntary associations. But then Putin becomes president, and he chips away at the free press, other political parties, political dissent, and voluntary associations were not able to stop him. They were not able to stop him. And then we have this kind of strange situation here where, yes, you can have a democracy that encourages the growth of civil society, but civil society cannot long defend that democracy against the power of a determined, undemocratic state which is kind of an uncomfortable conclusion to come to. Uh, much of this idea of civil society and encouraging civil society came out of a reading of Alexis de Tocqueville's uh, Democracy in America. And in Democracy in America, Tocqueville talks about how one of the characteristics of democracy in America is all of these voluntary associations. But it's possible that the arrow of causality is a little bit turned around it could be that democracy is a thing that leads to civil society rather than civil society leading to democracy. So you can see that, okay, we have lots and lots of uh, voluntary associations, but if the laws change and if the actual actions of the state change, uh, it's not enough to make sure that the state remains free. So now I'm talking more uh, about Putin himself. So, and this is something, this aspect is something that I think hasn't been understood well enough uh, in the United States. The really core role that the 1990s plays in, uh, in Putin's ability to, to keep power. 
So even though there were a lot of Russians who did well in the 1990s, probably even more saw this as a time of freefall in social conditions. Uh, there was a lot of crumbling infrastructure. Uh, as I talked about before, many of these cult cultural institutions could only survive because uh, the intellectuals played such a role and were willing to sacrifice so much to keeping them open. Um, many people died in these completely avoidable ways. So when, P when Putin came in and said, look, I'm providing order, I'm providing stability, the 1990s were a time of chaos, we don't want the 1990s again, so therefore come with me and we will avoid a re, you know, experiencing of that. So that made a lot of sense to, to many people, to many people in Russia because the 90s had been so terrible. Also because the US government had been kind of funding, in some cases, these NGOs, there were a lot of just ordinary Russians who sort of felt, well, these NGOs are, they are kind of representatives of the West. They're not emerging from our own needs. They're not emerging from within uh, Russia itself. And this also kind of weakens uh, support for civil society among Russians. Now, this is based more on my own experience, my experience in the provinces. I mean, I have not done this kind of social scientific uh, data collection here, but you know, I have been on the ground, and so I have, I've seen this from a perspective other than Moscow and St. Petersburg. So Putin, Putin himself, um, is very much engaged in using, uh, in using the past as a way to legitimize the present. He wants to find a ground, as it were, to show that he is unquestionably uh, legitimate in terms of the legitimization of his power. So here he is in front of the Minin and Pajarsky monument in Red Square. This is in front of St. Basil's, very famous monument, uh, very one, one of the most famous. I've taken pictures of this monument because I'm actually working on Pajarsky's grave. Pajarsky is the person, the, the statue, which is directly above Putin. Um, so I've actually done research on Pajarsky and the memorialization of his grave in, in Vladimir province. So the 17th century is what Putin has chosen for this ground for legitimation. And the new national day is this day of national unity on November 4th. And that's an important day where uh, the, the Poles, Menin and Pajarsky, chase out the Poles from Moscow in, in 1612. So what Putin is, is doing is saying, look, Russia is its own unique thing. It's its own unique state. We're surrounded by enemies. This is um, something that we need to do. We need to make sure we always defend this country uh, against the West. In, in this case, you know, Poland is, is seen as an emanation of the West. Uh, and we should be proud of being different, right? And being different can also mean not being democratic and, and standing up against the West. So one of the things that Putin did, which is actually not completely different from what Nicholas I did, is create a series of institutions for his new history. Right? Yeltsin was less interested in creating institutions, less interested in spreading a new narrative. It was more decentralized, which was in many ways congruent with the way that um, culture was going in general. So in the 90s, the textbooks were left to regional authorities. And then Putin established federal controls uh, over these history textbooks. And then he created a whole series of institutions to encourage the writing and filming of Russian history in a nationalist vein. And so some of those, those um, Russian uh, miniseries that you can see on Netflix, these are funded by the state, and it's part of this general kind of uh, push to create a more nationalist view of Russian history. So again, it's shown as exceptional, shown as surrounded by enemies, and so therefore you have to have a strong leader. By the way, a strong leader like Putin that needs to be there in order to protect 
the people within the state. Um, scholars have more money for publications, but the state also has more control over what's published. And I mean, that makes sense. Uh, so it's meant that a lot of, there's been a lot of really impressive documentary, um, a series of documents uh, published, like uh, many conservative thinkers. Of course, the, you know, the, the communists were not interested in putting out the complete works of these conservative thinkers. But under Putin, large uh, print runs have been uh, put out of uh, collected or selected works of various conservative thinkers that are actually quite useful for people who are studying that. But of course, yes, you do have more control. I mean, as a state, if you're giving them money, you do get to kind of call the tune. And many of these new works have a, a more nationalistic undertone. And I really see this in my work on Pajarsky uh, because you know, since 1612 has become this new crucial moment uh, in Putin's kind of narrative of, of Russian history, there's just been a tremendous amount of new work that's been done on 1612. And so it's really an interesting test case, as it were. And a lot of that work is very good and very careful. Um, publications of documents has been really quite useful. But some of it is just kind of wildly nationalistic and strange and has strange theories that come into it that are just pseudo-scientific. Uh, so it's a real kind of mixed bag there. Um, so in many ways, my book was conceived in the springtime of civil society and born in its fall. Uh, at first, I was taking a more basic idea of what I wanted to do. I was sort of saying, well, everybody can see that civil society, it was around after 1861, but maybe I could find it before 1861, which is you know, useful, but not exactly huge, right? It's just sort of saying, oh, we need to push back the, the beginning period for this. And then I started questioning, well, what, what does it mean to have a civil society? and what different kinds of ideas of civil society uh, are there. And in the 1860s and in the 1990s, civil society was more connected to elites, and it needed the support of state structure in order to reach the masses. And it's so, it's a kind of almost like limited civil society. In the 1860s, uh, a civil society was created that didn't incorporate the peasants in a really institutional way. I can talk about that more if, if you want. In the 1990s, many of these NGOs that were funded by, by the US were more connected to the intelligentsia of Moscow and St. Petersburg than to the people throughout uh, Russia. And, um, you know, civil society also, if it's defined in a way that prioritizes unity, it doesn't necessarily mean that civil society and voluntary associations are sort of hopeful places to have debates. If you feel that civil society is a place for unity and for having a overall view of the world uh, and that people who disagree are just kind of, as it were, messing up that unity, it's problematic. It can definitely be problematic. And um, so that is one of the things that was happening uh, in the 1850s and 1860s. And um, when these nobles were being challenged, especially by priest sons, as to their role in the voluntary associations, the nobility tended to fall back and say, well, look, you, you don't really have a right to come in here and criticize us. You're, you know, you're just a member of the clerical estate and, and we're nobles. So you know, even if you're committed to civil society, it doesn't mean that you're on board with all of the things that we consider crucial for civil society. I didn't expect it to happen, but the Russian state emerged as a really crucial subject for my book. And also, somewhat unexpectedly for me, I realized that if, if you don't understand the importance of the state you, and, you and you just promote civil society alone, it's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult to reach the goals of democratization. And you might fail to reach the goals, or you might even backfire. 
because you might create this idea of these groups are sort of alien, uh, these groups don't really need to be here. Uh, at the same time, in the last few, even the last few weeks, there have been interesting developments in, in Russia, uh, you know, the opposition uh, the opposition candidates have, have won some of the uh, local elections. And there is some interesting polling data that suggests that the younger generation is getting, is less receptive to Putin. And to me, that actually makes sense because so much of Putin's argument is we cannot go back to the 90s, we cannot go back to the disorder and the chaos of the 90s, that if you're from that time, that really resonates. But if you were born in the 90s, and the 90s are sort of a blur of like, I was in nursery school and I don't know what was really going on, you might not feel that. You might say, well, you know, Putin, you've been charged for, for almost two decades. What, what have you done? You know, what about me? What about my chance? So things can always change. Things can always uh, go in unexpected uh, directions. But I feel that in many ways, this concept of civil society, it's been there for so long. It's been so important for the history of the Russian state and the history of Russian governance. Uh, and it continues to be so important that I think if we have a really nuanced idea of civil society, what it is, what it can be, different visions of it, that it helps us to better understand uh, where Russia has been and where it is going. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs> Should I just, I guess I'm up here, I should just call. Okay. Yes. Um, so I have two questions about two or three different parts of your talk. Uh -huh. um, the first is just what role, if any, did um, this idea in the 1830s and 1840s of, I guess, trying to build a civil society or Nicholas was a commercial society play in the debate between the Westernizers and the Americans? Mm. Mm. Great. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, in Yeltsin's government, I think, in the 1990s. Right. So is there any evidence or any way, you know, convincing kind of argument that that aid, if provided, would have actually been, I guess, properly used or mm -hmm. would actually work? Um, and kind of going off of that, you know, that slide about, you know, corruption, humili massive humiliation about Yeltsin simply appearing next to Clinton when he was drunk and Clinton laughing, would there have been Yeah, yeah, no, th those are interesting questions. Um, one of the things that I found striking as I was reading an analysis of various Russian nationalist publications, and they're making various claims, and one of them was that Russia was not the loser of the Cold War, and the other one was that Russia should have received a Marshall Plan. The two don't go together very well if we think about what a Marshall Plan is and, you know, who it was for. Um, and I do think that more could have been done. Yes, there was corruption. Yes, there was corruption. But part of the corruption was enabled by this idea that, oh, well, the market should take care of it, right? So some of the issues of what was happening were sort of almost abetted by American approaches towards the issues that were going on, because many people felt from the American side that the state shouldn't have the, the crucial role, that instead the, um, you know, the, the civil society should take it over. So it is possible that if, if there had been programs that had been put in place thinking about corruption and trying to go around them, that there might have been some good impacts that, that could have been done. 
because if you just assume that the market will take care of it and you don't need to talk about structures of the state, it, it sort of encourages the corruption that was going on in parallel. Uh, so I do think it would have helped. I, I do think it would have helped. And at the very least, it would have shown a kind of willingness to uh, help the everyday Russian people that didn't really come through uh, in, in many ways uh, in, in the earlier period. Um, so what was the first part of the, of the question? Oh, just about the Kanslav. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Westerners. Um, so Herzen is, Herzen is a, uh, Alexander Herzen, he's a Westernizer. He is very much a part of this story. And it's an interesting, the story from Vladimir from the 1830s and the 1840s, he was in exile there. And he is very enthusiastic at the moment that uh, Nicholas puts forward these reforms. And he later kind of tries to erase that. It's an interesting thing, because the westernizers in many ways would seem to be the more natural recipients of these ideas. And yet, they're at this kind of national level, meaning really in this case, Moscow and St. Petersburg, and so they don't really take part in these processes. And curiously enough, the group that takes part by far the most uh, kind of comprehensively in them are the liberal Slavophiles. Now, liberal Slavophiles are barely ever focused on when we're talking about Slavophiles. Liberal Slavophiles believed that there were particularly uh, Russian aspects to economics. That is to say, it should be an agrarian society and not an industrial society, but that modernization of some sort was useful. And so for them, uh, these you know, um, small reforms are actually quite useful. And many of those liberal Slavophiles take part in the agricultural voluntary associations. So that's mainly where this resonates. But strangely enough, these whole dis discussions and the debates that I talk about uh, for the small reforms find almost no resonance within the discussions between the Slavophiles and the Westernizers uh, in the canonical text of those, yeah. Hmm? You make, obviously you're talking about two different eras. Right. But you make um, points about civil society that may be in tension with one another. Uh, let me ask this. The, in your book, you mm -hmm. look at the emergence of, the, the state brings sort of civil society into being or allows it, encourages mm -hmm. it to develop. And then in the 60s, pulls the rug out from mm -hmm. under it and says, we really want to control things from the center mm -hmm. and thwarts the development of these mm -hmm. civil societies, which you then say properly helps to lead to the revolution. You then go to the 1990s. What I would suggest is that civil society is less of a problem than it is that it has very shallow roots. And most mm -hmm. of those roots were thwarted by, but first the Tsar estate and later by the Soviet state. Mm -hmm. And then insofar as it was created, it's created by US government associations <laughs> trying to plant something right. that has very shallow roots in a right. country that has very little tradition of this. Right. So the problem is less civil society, it, is, it seems to me, than the fact that it didn't develop organically yeah. because it wasn't allowed to develop organically. Mm -hmm. Civil mm -hmm. society in states in Eastern Europe, like the Czech Republic or Poland, worked mm -hmm. because it developed from the bottom up. Right. But civil society developed from the top down is almost a contradiction in terms. What would you, what would you say to that? And by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm really concerned when I see Hong Kong demonstrators waving American flags. Mm. Not because I'm not proud to be an American, but are, do you realize what you're doing? Right. You're sort of saying it's a foreign This is an implant. alien idea. This is an alien idea that has to be implanted. Yeah, it is kind of funny to think that the U.S. government is more properly the parallel of, of Nicholas I. I mean, that's probably not too many people have ever made that parallel. Uh, but, I mean, there are certain exceptions. I do feel... When I hear that, when I hear a question, I realize this could be seen as almost a critique of Russian civil society, which is a little bit unfair when I think about how difficult it has been for the people that took that on as their, as their cause. There have been groups like Memorial, Memorial, which is a, a group that did emerge organically, and these are people within Russia that have been fighting to have a memory of the crimes of Stalin and to 
uh, talk about what happened with the gulag in, a, in an open way, and Putin has been very resistant to allowing them to even do basic sort of things. And yet, and yet, it is true that a lot of the civil society groups that were created after 91 did not emerge from within Russia, but from ideas from abroad. And saying that is a little uncomfortable because I'm sort of repeating what Putin said, although with different intentions, I assure you. So, um, but in some ways though, it's interesting that given that Putin closed down those societies that did get funding from abroad, perhaps in some ways that will actually help with the development of Russian civil society because all the ones that are left are de facto not funded from abroad because if they were funded from abroad, they wouldn't be allowed to exist. So in a curious kind of way, perhaps that action will lead to a more, more of a legitimation of Russian civil society groups within Russia. Um, yeah, yeah. Un but it, unintended consequences. Yeah, unintended consequences. I'm sure that was not on, on the to-do list, but yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, ersatz is kind of a complicated word there because it definitely saying, well, it's not real. You want, I mean, if one takes that point of view, you could say, well, Ukrainian nationalism isn't real, but what, is, what does that mean exactly? I mean, that's an argument from power in a way. Um, the Russian state was very undergoverned, very undergoverned. There weren't that many people who were literate for the expanse of Russia. And that's part of the reason why the Russian state reached out as much as it did to all of these educated people within Russia because they just didn't have the bureaucrats to do that work themselves and they had to reach out to those other people. So that was absolutely integral to the whole thing. Uh, and many of the bureaucrats, it's fascinating because I looked in some of the really nitty gritty uh, studies of these bureaucrats, many of them had like three to four years of education total. Right? three to four years of education total. So what that means is that they can read and write, but barely, you know. Um, so when you have someone who's in exile like Herzen, who is at this incredibly high level of understanding, I mean, he's read you know, all the philosophy and the literature from Western Europe, and he's there uh, in Vyatka and then later in Vladimir, he can really engage with the ideas of the state at this really high level. But most of the bureaucrats are like, hmm, uh, well, I'm not sure. I mean, it's like some of them, some of them count the number of houses when they're asked, what is the economic development of your town? They say, well, we have X number of houses. Well, that's not, you know, that's not really what economic development is, but if you, have a very rudimentary education, that's kind of at the level which you can engage. Uh, yeah, so, so there is that aspect to it. Now, the interesting thing that comes closest to what you're talking about is Siberian regionalism. It's a totally fascinating topic. Um, in 1863, there are these Siberian regionalists who create a manifesto, and this manifesto 
uh, calls for the creation of a United States of Siberia, which at some point perhaps could be federated with the United States of America. Now clearly that didn't happen, uh, and it was discovered because these officials found these cadets in this military school who were smoking, and I guess the cigarette papers included these manifestos. Therefore, the regionalists were arrested and exiled away from Siberia, uh, and, but then they were able to come back and even think more, you know, more systematically about uh, regionalism and the, the needs of Siberia. So in many ways, Siberia is the one that comes closest to that. Um, and then if you start saying, oh, well, and Ukraine is the same, you go down kind of dark path, which I, because, I mean, who is to say, I mean, what's a real nation and what isn't a real nation? Yeah, you know, it's, it's it, you have to be able to say, okay, these people believe themselves to be a nation, therefore there is a, an argument that's being made, and if other countries accept it, then they, then they accept it. Siberia is a fascinating case, though, and, and uh, you know, there were people relatively recently who attempted to create a Siberian language, for example, uh, and there has been you know, interest in uh, Siberian regionalism, which is difficult, though, to proceed because um, Putin is saying, well, you cannot you cannot propagandize any kind of um, secession or anything like that. So that, that is not something you can do. But in any case, yeah, these, these are, that is the place where you, where you see that at the kind of highest level. Yeah. Wow. Okay, in the back. Um, thanks, for, thanks for this talk. It sort of reaffirmed the conversation that Domingo and I had about how in some ways the post-Cold War period resembles the 19th century far more than the decade. Mm. Yeah. These tensions between nationalism and regionalism yeah. and globalization, which might be the engine that's churning all of this mm -hmm. in the 19th century, seem to be playing out in Russia, not too dissimilar mm -hmm. from in Italy or from the United States. Absolutely. Regionalism along you know, slavery being one of those lines. Exactly. Um, you mentioned Alexis de Tocqueville. Mm -hmm. Right. These Americans have it. Right. That play out in what some would say is capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it, it's through that sphere that civil society is so vibrant. Right. Um, is that applicable in Russia? Is it, a, I mean, the, is the, going back to Steve's question about the roots, are those conditions of individualism and a middle class mm -hmm. and sort of this um, aggressive uh, acquisitiveness that mm -hmm. the Tocqueville talks about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the liberals did read Tocqueville, and they, they were interested in it. There was a lot of discussion about it. I mean, when you read Democracy in America, you can see that this idea of individualism, a, coin that he termed, a term that he coined uh, in French, and then you know, it came into English through the translation, um, that he was very ambivalent about sure. individual, very ambivalent, because it has, a, it has a possibility to tear apart collectives as well. And of course, as a nobleman, he was so, he was not really thrilled about democracy being the future. He wasn't sort of like, democracy is the future. He's like, democracy is the future. Uh, but he wanted to be able to adapt to it. And the liberals in, in Russia, in many ways, found themselves in a sort of similar situation. Uh, the ones who were also Hegelian, there's a big overlap between the two of them. Uh, and they want to find a path where there can be some kind of middle class, and they, they use, they translate that term, but the awkwardness of the translation gives a sense of the difficulty of bringing it in. This idea of a middle estate, and of course the serious estates are like a state of nobles, a state of peasants, a state of clergy. These are states that you're born into. And the whole idea of a middle class is that you can join it, you're not born into it. So there's, they, they know that there is this concept of a, of a middle class class, 
and they're trying to introduce it within a system of estates because the most forward thinking of these nobles realize that there will be a moment where their privileges nobles will not be enough, that they will need to be part of something larger. But it is hard. It, had, it is hard to create that, even if you can understand that that's the future. So they are trying to create it. Um, and, you know, especially by the late 19th century, I mean, people have argued, and I do think it does make some sense, that there is an emerging middle class. But then, of course, you also get into the whole normative aspect of what does it mean to be middle class and what is your historical narrative. But at least it is interesting that they were engaged in that question, that they were thinking about how can we get there. And of course they weren't there. I mean, how can you have a middle class in a society of estates and serfdom? And you know, it's, it's not very realistic, but the, that, was a, that was a very uh, crucial topic to the people back at the time. And Tocqueville was discussed a lot. And also, of course, the French Revolution, you know, because they saw the parallels. I mean, they, they saw the potential parallels, which many people after 1917 drew with even more information, of course. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering about the role of the Russian Orthodox Church. Hmm. Like, before Putin took over, like in that kind of period of chaos, the liberal class was there. So did, was there an attempt to kind of fill the spaces that the, that were left as the state institution collapsed and then the civil society, did the church fall trying to fill those spaces? Yeah, the church, the, I mean, there, the 90s, there was a lot of uh, many voluntaristic kind of things. There were a lot of things that were going on. Um, the church did, you know, do those, do, did do those kind of things, it's true. And there was a lot of taking back of property, although that usually meant displacing the intelligentsia. So it's like, we're going to take back this church from a museum get out museum, you know, so it's sort of like, hmm, who, who am I in favor of here? It's, it's a little bit awkward. Um, but, I mean, there have been scholars who have argued that the Russian Orthodox Church really was formed within the Soviet system and because of the many depredations that the Soviets kind of inflicted upon the church that it was kind of reformed as it was in, in a non-reformed way, um, and that it was all too willing to become the partner of power. Of course, it had been a state church even before, but so once Putin came in, it made a lot of sense to many you know, high-ranking members of the church to work along with it. But of course, the 90s were a much more complicated thing because you didn't have, you didn't have a kind of state line, as it were. You didn't have as clear of a, of a record. And so now, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church is very much taking part in this new historical narrative. And, um, you know, the, there are these high-ranking clerics are, you know, involved in the creation of this Putinist uh, nationalist historiography. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult, though, to completely say this is what was happening in the 90s because so much was happening in so many different places and so much depended on the, the local, um, you know, the, the local clerics, you know, the, the bishops and the archbishops. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You know, earlier I saw less hope. Now I find it interesting that there, there does seem to be a shift. There are more people who are in support of these demonstrations that have been happening. Uh, and when you're in support of those demonstrations, like, you know, bad things can happen to you. I mean, it's, it's not like uh, you just say, oh, I've signed this thing on Facebook and nothing's going to happen to me. You know, things having that kind of support really can lead to, to difficult situations in your life. And I think it does make sense that there could be a generational shift and that 
you know, as I said before, Putin keeps on saying it's better than the 90s. And if you think, well, I wasn't even around, let's try something different. So perhaps there, there can be. I, uh, perhaps there can be. And I think, you know, Putin is always worried about this. Uh, there's something I read, I don't remember where exactly, that uh, someone was saying that Putin was watching in the darkness over and over again uh, the body of uh, Gaddafi being dragged through the streets. And it's interesting to think, well, what might he be thinking? You know, it could be, if I don't do things right, that could be me. You know? So the stakes are really high for him. The stakes are really high for him. But if you do have a generational shift, it's hard to, it's hard to keep control over a whole group of people who reject the legitimation of the state. You know, if you reject the legitimation of the state, then things can happen in a revolutionary sort of situation. And that's, I mean, Putin has been terrified of that. I mean, that's part of the reason why he's so worried about all these color revolutions. So maybe I should take him seriously and say, well, if he's so afraid of it, I suppose it, it could happen. It could happen there. Um, but, you know, revolutions don't happen on schedule. And you don't, it, it's very hard to say, OK, this is what leads to a revolution. I mean, there's change, and it's often hard to see when the change has kind of reached a point where something definitively happens. So I wish I could be more specific. But if I could be, I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be doing something way more important. So <laughs> not that I'm, I'm really glad to be here, you know, and I'm, but, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, those are not all the opposition is actually what we would think of as liberal democratic. Mm -hmm. So, like, where do we have, do you have a sense of just having been on the ground and then having studied this? Like, is it most like is when we think of democracy, do they have a very different conception there, even without the, the, the pains of the 90s and mm -hmm. that? But do you have a sense just sort of on, on that question? Well, I mean, I'm not sure. So you're, you're saying you're, there could be a possibility that there could be a far right development. Well, because so there's, there's both the disaffected communists, of which right. I think many of them right. sort of have That's that true. very sort of um, nostalgic view of the people mm -hmm. who are actually not necessarily fully happy, as far as I understand, with, with, with um, even as far as Putin's gone, and certainly um, you know, people on the far right who, who said he's actually excluded from government. Mm -hmm. and so like, what are they sort of just on the margins, or is Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the people that are coming out in favor of these these uh, demonstrations, for example, are supporters of Navalny. Navalny is more or less along the you know the more uh, liberal group. Uh, but it is important to to say things could change in a more right wing direction too. Um, so. But yeah, I, I think a lot of the opposition is within that more liberal, you know, group that that you were discussing. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. one more: mm -hmm. Are there any uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos type of people in Russia with the influence and the power that they have here? You know, it's an interesting question. I mean, most of the oligarchs. Uh, did get their money from stripping the state of its assets. They're getting old so, now. But they're, yeah, and they're getting old now. You do have interesting people like Prokhorov, Mikhail Prokhorov, I mean, uh, and other people who, you know, there was asset stripping, and, and then he created his own uh, foundation, and so he is trying to, to do good and to, to change things. But there is more of a focus on raw materials and kind of, you know, primary, you know, uh, oil, aluminum, this kind of thing. And that does make it 
harder to have the kind of like Bill Gates sort of figure arising. And that's all the more striking when you think about how good uh, the math and science education is in Russia. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, when I was there a couple of years ago, they said, oh, we've reformed our math uh, K through 12 to be more like the American. And I said, <laughs> is this a joke? <laughs> Uh, because, you know, yeah, anyway, I don't have to go into those details. But, um, yeah, so who knows? Maybe the next generation will be less so. I'm not sure. But, yeah, there is a kind of, there is a kind of disparity there where, yes, you do have these people that have a lot of money, um, but in many cases they did not make it from making things but from taking things. And many of the people that are in prison right now in Russia are entrepreneurs who people have used, other people have used the state to just expropriate their companies from them. So obviously that doesn't really provide a good experience or a good context for the emergence of this kind of uh, new kind of gospel of wealth people to arise. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. They do have a Bill Gates, Sergey Brin, but he's in the United States. Yeah, that's true. That's a great answer. They do have a Bill Gates, of Sergey Brin, but he works in the U.S. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I wish I had that answer. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well,